the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. For the faithful, it is a place of pilgrimage and worship. A roar mixed with joy and tears welcomes the light coming out of the Holy Sepulchre. In a few minutes it spreads throughout the Basilica from the candles of the Greek Patriarch. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre remains a beacon of spiritual devotion and historical reverence in the heart of Jerusalem's old city. Amidst its ancient walls and hallowed halls, an astounding miracle unfolded within this sacred haven, although not unprecedented but nonetheless extraordinary. Reportedly, the eyes of the crucifix, steeped in centuries of silent vigil, opened after an eternity of being closed. This astonishing occurrence, while not unprecedented in the annals of faith, still resonates as a profound and rare phenomenon. It's a moment that defies the ordinary. Stay tuned as the tale behind this miraculous event unfolds, promising to captivate hearts and minds alike with its transcendent significance. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, also referred to as the Church of the Resurrection, is located in the Christian quarter of Jerusalem's Old City. Dating back to the 4th century, it holds profound significance as Christianity's most revered pilgrimage destination, revered as the holiest site for Christians globally. It is believed to be the place where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. The church has been a major pilgrimage destination for Christians for centuries. For over 160 years, control of the church has remained in a complex arrangement involving various Christian denominations and secular entities, with some arrangements dating back even further. The primary denominations overseeing different sections of the church include the Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Armenian Apostolic with lesser involvement from the Coptic, Syriac, and Ethiopian Orthodox churches, all of which conduct Holy Mass there daily. The church's architecture and historical significance make it a focal point for religious and cultural tourism in Jerusalem. The site hosts various ceremonies during special occasions, such as the Holy Saturday's Holy Fire, led by the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, joined by the Coptic and Armenian Patriarchs. Hidden within the intricate iron latticework of the Coptic chapel lies the altar cherished by the Coptic Orthodox community. Historically, the Georgians were custodians of the key to the edicule. The edicule is a term whose secrets we'll uncover as we delve deeper into this topic. This revered sanctuary, cherished by Christians worldwide, recently bore witness to an extraordinary event of divine intervention. This celestial manifestation, perceived as a divine sign, resonated profoundly within the hearts of pilgrims and believers alike, underscoring the preserved sanctity and allure of this revered site. Exploring the origins of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Behind me, you can see the statue of the Blessed Mother and the crucifixion place. So the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built covering two important sites, the Golgotha and the sepulchre itself offers valuable insights into its importance and the circumstances leading to its establishment. Also having a deep understanding of the context and components of the church provides a deeper understanding of the miraculous event that transpired within its walls. Before we take a dive into the details of this remarkable event, let's explore the historic significance and the spiritual connection of this church to Jesus Christ and the early Christians. How did they come about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? The crucifixion of Jesus occurred in 1 saint century Judea, most likely in AD 30 or AD 33. This event is recounted in the four canonical Gospels of the New Testament, referenced in epistles, supported by other ancient sources, and widely acknowledged as a probable occurrence in his life. Despite its acceptance, historians do not universally agree on all the specifics. According to the canonical Gospels, Jesus underwent arrest and trial by the Sanhedrin, followed by sentencing from Pontius Pilate, ultimately leading to his scourging and crucifixion by the Romans. His death is depicted as a sacrificial act for the atonement of sin. Jesus was stripped of his clothing and given vinegar mixed with myrrh or gall, likely pasca, to drink after expressing thirst. As if that wasn't enough, he was then crucified at Golgotha, placed between two convicted thieves. According to the Gospel of Mark, he died by the ninth hour of the day, around 3 p.m. Following Jesus' death, a soldier, 
traditionally identified as Longinus in extra-biblical accounts, pierced his side with a spear to confirm his passing. This action resulted in the flowing of blood and water from the wound. After Jesus' death, Joseph of Arimathea took his body down from the cross and placed it in a rock-hewn tomb, with assistance from Nicodemus. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 4, it is stated that Jesus was resurrected from the dead on the third day following his crucifixion. According to the canonical Gospels, he appeared to his disciples on multiple occasions before ascending to heaven. Dating back to the 4th century, according to tradition, the church encompasses two sacred sites held in high esteem in Christianity. These two pivotal sites are the Calvary, where Jesus was crucified, and the tomb where his resurrection took place. Originally a Jewish burial ground, the site later hosted a pagan temple. In 312, Constantine the Great, inspired by a vision of a cross in the sky, embraced Christianity and issued the Edict of Milan, granting legal status to the religion. Bishop Macarius of Jerusalem sought Constantine's approval to excavate the tomb site. Assisted by Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea, they discovered three crosses near a tomb. The one reputed to have miraculous healing powers was believed to be the true cross upon which Jesus was crucified, leading to the identification of Calvary by the Romans. Following this, in 326 CE, Constantine commanded the construction of a church at the site. Over time, all accumulated soil and debris were cleared from the cave, unveiling a rock-cut tomb identified as the burial place of Jesus. Constructed under Constantine in the 4th century and demolished by Al-Hakim in 1009, the church and rotunda were subsequently rebuilt with alterations by Emperor Constantine IX Monomachos and the Crusaders, significantly deviating from the original design. Enclosed within a 19th century shrine known as the Edicule, the tomb remains a focal point. The church houses the last four stations of the Via Dolorosa, symbolizing the final stages of Jesus' passion. Since its establishment in the 4th century, it has been a significant pilgrimage site for Christians, revered as the traditional place of Christ's resurrection, reflected in its original Greek name, the Church of the Anastasis, meaning resurrection. This is a great day, a very exciting day. Uh, first of all, to see the archaeology, uh, what's actually contained in the Edicule, uh, to see some of the original bedrock where Jesus would have uh, been laid after his death. According to the New Testament, Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, also known as the Place of the Skull, which is believed to have been situated in an area of stone quarries beyond the city walls during that era. Approximately 10 years post the crucifixion, a third wall was constructed, encompassing the site of Jesus' execution and burial within the city limits. This historical context lends credence to the placement of the Holy Sepulchre within the present-day Old City of Jerusalem. The church now encompasses both sacred locations. The Grand Basilica, known as the Martyrium, enshrines the traditional site of Calvary in one section. Opposite stands the Anastasis, Resurrection, enclosing Jesus' cave tomb. Consecrated on September 13, 335 CE, the church still boasts its original wooden doors from 326 CE, underscoring its ancient magnificence. At the entrance of the church, a stairway ascends to Calvary, Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, adorned with lavish decorations. Another stairway descends from this site to the ambulatory for exiting. Calvary comprises two chapels, one Greek Orthodox and the other Catholic. The Greek Orthodox Chapel's altar rests upon the Rock of Calvary, also serving as the twelfth station of the cross, accessible for touching through a designated hole in the floor beneath the altar. Located just beneath the Golgotha Chapel on the ground floor is the Chapel of Adam. Legend holds that Jesus was crucified directly above the burial site of Adam's skull. Some accounts suggest that Christ's blood flowed down the cross and into the rocks filling Adam's skull. Through a window in the 11th century apse, visitors can glimpse the Rock of Calvary, bearing a crack traditionally attributed to the earthquake following Jesus' death. However, some scholars argue it resulted from quarrying against a natural flaw in the rock. A statue of Mary, situated between the Catholic and Greek altars, signifies the 13th station of the cross, 
Near the entrance of the church lies the Stone of Anointing, also known as the Stone of Unction, where according to tradition, Joseph of Arimathea prepared Jesus' body for burial. This tradition emerged during the Crusader era, notably recorded by the Italian Dominican pilgrim Ricoldo da Monte di Croce in 1288. The current stone was installed during the 1810 reconstruction. The wall behind the stone is distinguished by its vibrant blue balconies adorned with red banners bearing the symbol of the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre. Lamps illuminate the area, while a modern mosaic adorns the wall, depicting the anointing of Jesus' body. To the right, the mosaic shows the descent from the cross, while to the left, it portrays the burial of Jesus. Initially a temporary addition, the wall was constructed to reinforce the weakened arch above it following damage from the 1808 fire. It currently obstructs the view of the rotunda, divides the entrance from the Catholicon, and rests upon four now empty and desecrated Crusader graves. However, it is no longer required for structural support. There is debate over whether it should be regarded as the 13th Station of the Cross, with some associating it with the lowering of Jesus from the cross, positioned between the 11th and 12th stations on Calvary. Additionally, the lamps above the Stone of Unction, decorated with cross-bearing chain links, are donated by Armenians, Copts, Greeks, and Latins. Suspended above the stone is an elaborate stand adorned with lamps, candles, and incense. That's not all. The church also features the rotunda, housing a larger dome, and sits on the far western side. At its center lies a small chapel known as the Edicule, derived from the Latin Edicula, denoting a diminutive shrine. Within the Edicule are two chambers, one housing a relic named the Angel's Stone, believed to be a fragment of the stone that sealed the tomb, and the other, a smaller room, containing the tomb of Jesus. To deter pilgrims from taking fragments of the original rock as souvenirs, a layer of marble cladding was added to the tomb by 1555. In October 2016, the top slab was removed, unveiling an older, partly damaged marble slab bearing a Crusader-style cross carving. Beneath it, the limestone burial bed remained intact. On the northwestern edge of the rotunda, adjacent to the sepulcher, lies the Chapel of the Apparition, exclusively designated for Roman Catholic worship. On March 22, 2017, a ceremony took place at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, marking the completion of conservation, restoration, and rehabilitation of the Edicule. The event was attended by an official delegation from Armenia, led by Foreign Minister Edward Nalbandian, as well as Prime Minister of Greece Alexis Tsipras, dignitaries from various countries, leaders of Christian churches, and numerous pilgrims. On the morning of that same day, Edward Nalbandian visited the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem, engaging in a meeting with Patriarch Archbishop Nurhan Manugian. Following their discussions, a procession led by Patriarch Nurhan Manugian and Minister Nalbandian made its way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where a solemn ceremony commemorating the restoration of the Edicule unfolded. At Golgotha, the site of the Lord's crucifixion, an altar stands beneath which pilgrims can venerate the precise spot where the Lord's cross was planted in the ground. Above the altar hangs a crucifix, depicting the crucified Lord with closed eyes. The crucifix serves as the primary adornment of the altar, reminding both the celebrant and the congregation that the victim offered on the altar is the same as the one offered on the cross. Hence, it must be placed on the altar whenever Mass is celebrated, as stated in the Constitution Accepimus by Benedict XV on July 16, 1746. According to the rubric of the Roman Missal, the crucifix should be positioned at the center of the altar between the candlesticks, ensuring it is large enough for both the celebrant and the congregation to easily see. If for any reason the crucifix is removed, another may temporarily take its place at a lower position but it must remain visible to all attendees of the Mass. It is worth noting that while a crucifix must typically be present on the altar during Mass, there are two exceptions to this rule. They include situations where the crucifixion is depicted as the main feature of the altarpiece or picture behind the altar. 
It's important to note that this applies specifically when the crucifixion is the primary focus, as opposed to depictions of saints holding a crucifix or kneeling before a cross. Additionally, another exception occurs when the most blessed sacrament is exposed. In both scenarios, the standard crucifix may be placed on the altar. In the case of the latter, local customs are to be adhered to. Furthermore, if the crucifix remains on the altar, it is not to be incensed. Before Emperor Constantine's reign in the 4th century, Christians were cautious about openly depicting the cross due to fear of ridicule or persecution. However, after Constantine's conversion to Christianity, he banned crucifixion as a form of execution and encouraged the use of the cross and the Chai Ro monogram as symbols of the Christian faith. Consequently, these symbols gained widespread popularity in Christian art and funerary monuments around 350 AD. In the centuries following Constantine's reign, Christian veneration of the cross focused on Christ's triumph over evil and death, avoiding detailed depictions of his suffering. The earliest crucifixes depicted Christ alive, with eyes open and arms outstretched, emphasizing his divinity despite his wounds. However, by the 9th century, artists began emphasizing the realistic portrayal of Christ's suffering and death. As a result, Western representations of the crucifixion, whether in painting or sculpture, evolved to convey a heightened sense of pain and agony, with increasing artistic finesse. In Romanesque crucifixes, Christ is often depicted wearing a royal crown, but in later Gothic styles, this was replaced by a crown of thorns. However, in the 20th century, a new emphasis emerged in Roman Catholicism, particularly in liturgical crucifixes. Christ on the cross is portrayed as a crowned and vested king and priest, with less emphasis on the marks of his suffering. The crucifix retains its status as a powerful symbol of Christ, remaining integral to the practice of exorcisms. What happened to the crucifix in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, revered and venerated by the followers of the Christian faith, became holier on Wednesday, March 29th. Here is what actually happened. A purported miraculous occurrence has been reported recently at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the Holy City. A custodian of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, Father Theodore Dodd witnessed an extraordinary occurrence. He shared an account of a miracle unfolding on Wednesday, March 29th, within the hallowed walls of the historic church. Here's what happened. During the early hours of the day, the eyes of the crucifix icon located directly above an altar, situated at the exact coordinates of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, was noticed to be glowing ominously after being previously sealed shut for eternity. The eyes abruptly opened and remained that way for the whole day, captivating several witnesses aside from Father Theodore Dodd with its divine gaze. Taking to his Facebook page on April 1st, Father Theodore Dowd pens a gripping narrative of the extraordinary event that unfolded the previous Wednesday. Among the multitude of priests and visitors present, he recounts the testimony of his friend, Archimandrite Malateus Basil, whose acquaintance captured the moment in vivid detail through photographs. According to Father Theodore, the normally closed eyes of the crucified Christ on the icon remained open, defying the usual order of things and leaving an indelible mark on all who bore witness to this divine spectacle. Early the next day, on March 30th, Archimandrite Melasios shared the pictures on his Facebook page, expressing awe by writing, Wondrous art thou, O Lord, in thy saints. The cross of Golgotha opened its eyes. This is the first time this has happened. The crucified Lord on Golgotha always has his eyes closed. But today, for some reason, he miraculously opened his eyes. According to Father Theodore Dodd, he mentioned that since the original article was posted, they've received a variety of comments and feedback. Some sources affirm the miracle, citing contacts in Jerusalem, while others claim it has been denied by the Holy Sepulchre. Therefore, acknowledging the countless miracles that have transpired in the Holy Land, the very place where the Lord lived, walked, died, and rose again for our salvation, we remain open to the possibility of God continuing to bestow blessings upon His Church through miracles. 
The miraculous event unfolds just a mere week following the completion of renovations on the revered edicule sheltering the Lord's tomb. It precedes by two weeks the highly anticipated annual celebration of the Holy Fire within the sacred precincts of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on Holy Saturday. But this event has an history of being caught in the web of skepticism because of some incidents we are about to explore. Similar events have been reported prior to this. One example was a viral video circulating in early August 2016, purported to show a statue of Jesus Christ in a Mexican church, opening and closing its eyes miraculously, garnering international media attention. Several tabloids reported on August 10th about the footage emerging from the Chapel of Saltillo, sparking widespread discussion on social media. Despite claims of authenticity by paranormal investigator Ivan Escamilla, skepticism prevailed, with many attributing the incident to an optical illusion or video editing. Also, a similar incident was reported in a small village in Nigeria. The Catholic Church of St. Augustine became the talk of the town on November 8, 2016, when a hanging crucifix of Christ reportedly began emitting a radiant light. Witnesses claimed that the carbon copy of Christ resembling his post-resurrection appearance with a crown on its head, shimmered like precious stone. The phenomenon attracted both Christians and non-Christians, who fervently reached out to touch the illuminated crucifix, exclaiming prayers for salvation. However, amidst the frenzy, doubts arose about the authenticity of the phenomenon, with some viewers suggesting mass hysteria rather than a divine occurrence. In light of the miraculous events and the history of doubt that accompanies such phenomenon, Father Theodore urges us to focus on the essence of our faith, emphasizing that while miracles, born of God's love, may fortify our wavering faith, they are not its sole foundation. Our faith transcends such displays, rooted in our profound encounters with God incarnate, our communion with Him, and our witness to His crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension. He reminds us of the greatest miracle, often overlooked, the transubstantiation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ during every divine liturgy. It's a poignant call to remain ever mindful of this sacred reality. Conclusively, Theodore reflects on the miraculous event as a sign from God to strengthen faith and remember the divine love demonstrated through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. He calls for repentance and preparation for Holy Week and Resurrection, offering praise for all things. This remarkable occurrence, steeped in the sanctity and mystique of the Holy Sepulchre, serves as a testament to the enduring power of faith and the transcendent nature of the sacred space it inhabits. Thanks for watching till the end. What do you think about this extraordinary finding? Just like Father Theodore, do you also think this could be a sign from God or it doesn't count as one to you? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like